Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Hatchie River Conservancy. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's special guest, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I recently, for the first time, went through our earthquake simulator, and that was very impressive. Uh, feels kind of real. Shame on me that you haven't already done that. I cannot believe you just did it for the first time. Um, I did it uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had a group come down from the University of Tennessee. Uh, they had some uh, folks from Africa, a delegation from Africa who uh, were ag educators and folks who worked in various areas of agriculture, and they loved the earthquake simulator. I, they were laughing and they, you know, it, what a great way. I always try to start there because it's a great way for people to really learn what uh, this area is all about because the earthquake and the real foot lake that was formed really uh, contributes a lot to this whole area. Thank you for that, Zach. So our guest today is John Nesbitt, who's been doing research into the Davy Crockett Hunting Club for obvious reasons. I'm fascinated by the, the work he's doing. Welcome, John. Well, thank you, Scott and Zach. Both, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So before we dive into the club, tell us just a brief bio. Um, who is uh, John Nesbitt? Well, I, uh, I'm a... A retired thoracic surgeon. I practiced for about 35 years uh, in Texas, and in, uh, most of my time was in Nashville. Um, I, uh, I served three years in the Navy prior to uh, my practice in Houston, and um, enjoyed the the uh, being an academic thoracic surgeon for 35 years, and uh, and currently enjoying retirement. I've been retired now for two years. So you're an educator, uh, medical uh, veteran who likes to duck hunt. You're sort of the living embodiment of Discovery Park of America. <laughs> well, maybe I can add a tidbit to the park. Where were you in Texas? In Houston. Okay. Okay, great. I uh, went to high school in Fort Worth, so I'm always curious when people say they were from Texas. You know, what part of the state? Well, I was a proud Texan while I was there. Um, I haven't had any good Tex-Mex since I left. I don't know about you. That's that's where you go to have it. Well, that's right. And they are very proud of it, too. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about a lot of people may not even realize there was a or is a Davy Crockett hunting club. For clarification, academics caught, know that he was David Crockett. But uh, from a pop culture and from, uh, you know, from, from that standpoint of what we're talking about today, it's Davy Crockett. So people will forgive me when I call him Davy Crockett today. Um, tell us a little bit about how you first found out about the Davy Crockett Hunting Club. Well, uh, I was, my father was one of the charter members of the club. And so I was introduced to the club when I was a kid, when I was in the third grade, that was the first time I saw the club and experienced it, it uh, soon after the the opening of the current club. And so uh, you, I'm guessing he took you uh, duck hunting frequently? Uh, well, um, <laughs> yes. It, in the beginning, uh, I guess my first experience was, again, when I was in the uh, in the third grade. Um and I was eight years old, and the club began in 1963, and this was really about his first hunt at the club in 1963, and he wanted to take my brother and me, my older brother and, and me, hunting, and he took a friend of his and that friend's son, so there were, and the guide, and there were six of us crammed into this tiny little flat-bottom boat, um, it was one of the most terrifying days I've ever had in my life. Uh, we took out in the cold and the dark. We're running over stumps and submerged logs and got into the blind. Uh, I don't remember seeing a duck that day, 
Um, I don't think we shot a duck that day. I, I was not even tall enough to see over the front of the blind. Um, and uh, I did shoot a shotgun, though, for the first time out the side of the blind, out the door, and it knocked me down. So that was my introduction to shotgunning. That was my introduction to duck hunting. On the ride back, a thunderstorm came up, which, again, made it even more terrifying. And, uh, and I vowed after that that I've never duck hunt again. <laughs> so that was my first experience. Um, but like in the Ted Lasso show, have the mind of a goldfish or the memory of a goldfish that went away. And four years later, I hunted again with my father and my uncle, and uh, they introduced me to real duck hunting. And I was hooked at that point. So for, for, for our listeners who don't know what duck hunting really entails, they may think that you just go stand on the side of of uh, a body of water and shoot any ducks that happen to land. Give us just a little bit of a overview of exactly how you go about duck hunting. <laughs> at least in, at least in our neck of the woods, let's do it out. Cause I know it's different everywhere. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, that's a tough one. Uh, and I'm sure I'll, I'll be speaking to the choir when I give this answer, but uh, through the years, I've been asked that question uh, many times. Uh, people ask, well, why in the world do you get up at 4.30 in the morning, go out in the wet, the dark, the freezing weather, to sit uh, shivering in a cold box and do so for hours at a time with a smelly dog and three other smelly men just to shoot a duck? <laughs> I mean, what is there not to love about that? You know, <laughs> we savor such times. As duck hunters, that's what we enjoy. And you know we're we're an we're a, a, an odd breed of of, of people, uh, and there's a mystery behind that passion. And in the end, it's really, I think, hard to explain the thrill that's derived from from hunting. Uh, there are so many features about the actual hunt. If you're asking about the hunt itself, uh, I guess you can distill it down to. Uh, to name a few, you know to itemize a few things, just you know. That are fun. Setting up the blind of the location, arranging the the proper decoy spread, calling the ducks, uh, fashioning the proper duck call cadence. I guess watching the beauty of a flight of ducks as they circle and circle until they commit. Um, timing the the gunshot, uh, handling a, a dog if you have a dog in the blind, and and watching it retrieve. Uh, there's so much more the anticipation being in the moment uh it's always an exciting series of events um and you know and that's not just the hunt itself um for me duck hunting is not simply just firing a pistol and bagging a bird that's actually a minor part for me uh, so much more goes into the hunt it's not just the hunt itself you know the planning details the endless analysis of your firearm or the equipment or the shotgun shell shells type the type of shot uh, debate about the weather forecast the wind direction along with the you know the optimal hunt site food and meal prep before and after the morning take and even you know if we're down there for a few days if we're hunting and we have a uh, we're always preparing these delicious meals and Frequently, the feast is fresh duck. <laughs> um, and then the fireside chats that come and the stories and the camaraderie. It's, it's, it's just a wonderful um, set of circumstances with irreplaceable memories. And so, you know, it's, it's it, it, you know, what, and if I can continue, what's even more special for me is having my son, William, and my black lab gunner on the hunt. Uh, being with them and watching the passion and the eagerness that both of them have is 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 thrilling. And you know, Gunner, the dog, he knows he knows when we're going hunting. <laughs> He's usually the most excited, and he absolutely loves it. You know, the boat ride out in the dark, the tinkering with the decoys, listening to the wing beats in the dark, watching a morning or a winter sunrise, um, working a flight of greenheads. Um, at cooking breakfast in the blind, it's just, those are all cemented memories. And sharing that with your child is so special, um, you know, and having those memories, 
those moments are, they're all too fleeting. And, and often we don't sit back and smile and appreciate those times until after the fact when we realize the importance of having been there free of TV and electronics and, you know, away from everyday and outside distractions. It's just a, a garnered special time and makes you want to come back. Well, and that's what I hear from a lot of folks about waterfowl hunting is the relational aspects of it. And, you know, when I asked you all ago, the first memory is with your father, you know, so uh, it's really uh, an interesting sport in that you do get to spend some quiet time with your family and friends. And, you know, I've, I've gone uh, duck hunting a few times and uh, it is true. It it's unlike anything else. I just wish you didn't have to get up quite so early. <laughs> no. so let's no. let's no. back up to uh 1930 in the 1930s and ralph morton here in union city tennessee um you have begun compiling the history of the uh davy crockett hunting club which is um how we first uh, became acquainted and it's really really well done i did want to ask you your background is in healthcare and in education. You are such a great writer. How, where did, uh, have you been writing all along or, you know, is that something new? Uh, well, you're awfully nice to say that. I, I, um, it, it, I have been writing throughout my career off and on. I've, I've, I've published a textbook um, that can really put you to sleep at night if you are looking for a way to get sleep. <laughs> um, and I've, published a, a, a number of uh, medical articles throughout the years. Um, so I have had some uh, bit of writing experience through the years. Yes. Well, this is, this is uh, really well done. Uh, the, the part that I read. So let's, you know, tell the folks that are listening who haven't gotten the opportunity to read what you've written about Ralph Morton and his idea one point I wanted to make is it's very similar. <clears throat> what you wrote reminded me of discovery park and, uh, Robert Kirkland, because you wrote that, you know, how did one guy's idea and his ability to spread the idea to others, you know, generate the club. So same thing with Robert Kirkland, his, uh, his idea and his, his skills created discovery park. So tell us about Ralph Morton. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, in getting into that, it's, it's an interesting story, but if I can add a little bit of background just to give a, a bit of a preamble with regards to, I think it'll make the, the story a little bit better about Ralph. Yeah, please do. Please do. Um, so uh, after World War II, um, duck hunting and the number of duck hunting clubs expanded uh, exponentially uh, up and down the Mississippi Flyway and actually throughout the country. But in the Mississippi Flyway in particular, from Minnesota to Louisiana, a lot of clubs sprang up. Um, and the reasons for this was, uh, were, were a couple. Uh, during the post-war era in the 40s and 50s, the country was going through an economic boom, but also it was a time for uh, people to reinvigorate their interest in recreation and outdoor pastimes, including hunting. More impactfully was the wet weather in the 1940s that delivered a number of years of much needed rain to the, what we call the prairie pothole region, the PPR, which is the primary waterfowl breeding grounds in Central North America, in the Dakotas, Minnesota and, and Montana, and Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, the wet breeding grounds have always been the number one catalyst for duck production throughout the country, and particularly in the Mississippi Flyway, where we are. Um, the heavy rains during that time reversed the severe drought that the country uh, had been plagued with during uh, the Dust Bowl days of the 1930s, and waterfowl numbers, as a consequence, responded quickly and were high throughout North America and again in the Mississippi Flyway. So uh, if you condense it down to the area in Tennessee, in the Obion River and Forked Deer River regions, they became popular areas for duck hunters who in particular wanted to hunt mallards um, that were attracted to the thousands of flooded hardwoods in the Tennessee area. Um, 
and particularly the the oak trees that lived in that time uh, in that area. And the local guides uh, cropped up to accommodate the hunters, and uh, they provided ample opportunity for the hunters who came from up and down the in adjacent states to hunt specifically mallards. So Davy Crockett Hunting Club evolved out of that setting. So we move into the story of Ralph Morton. Uh, Ralph, uh, he lived in Union City. And uh, in the 1940s, uh, he was uh, the assistant manager and a chief, the chief clerk of Davy Crockett Hotel in Union City. Uh, and I, I've always wanted to, I have not been able to find a bit more about the, that particular hotel, but I plan to when I return this year to Union City during the hunting season. Well, and the the hotel is still standing, um, and it's right across the street from where a ton of new development is going there and new condos that uh, a gentleman named David Ring has been working on. There's a brand new coffee shop and a new bakery. Oh, wow. And so a, a lot of uh, revitalization has been going on right across the street from the Davy oh, wow. Crockett Hotel. I, I uh, looked in the window uh, the other day to check it out. It's really a, a, a interesting looking building. So it's still there. Well, that's interesting. It was, you know, it was built in 19, in the 1930s. And uh, interestingly, by, by a, a fellow by the last name of Beck, B-E-C-K, and his relative, uh, I think it was um, Embry Beck was his name, and his, a relative of his, Herbert Beck, uh, was president of the Canvas Decoy Company that started in the 1890s. And we and they, actually have some of those. On display here at Discovery Park, really, some oh, of wow. his canvas duck decoys and the the bag box kind of thing that it came yeah, in. And yeah. We have those in two different places here at Discovery Park. Oh, wow. Those are very valuable. They're, they came in wooden boxes, came in as a dozen in a wooden box. It's a, it's really a neat looking thing. They, um, But they the canvas decoy company sold canvas duck decoys throughout the country, and they also sold raincoats. <laughs> anyway, that's a that's a side note um, to the man who who built the uh, and owned the Davy Crockett Hotel. So um, anyway, back to Ralph Morton. He uh, not only was the 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 assistant manager of the hotel, but he was a very avid duck hunter and fisherman, and he regularly served as a guide for duck hunts on on Real Foot Lake as well as in the Obine Bottoms. Um, it, during the forties, when, with this resurgence of duck hunting, uh, he was very busy and he was a popular guide and he and a colleague, uh, a Colonel Earl Houston got together and decided that they wanted to put together a commercial club and they named their outfit, Davy Crockett hunting club. And as you mentioned, and as you know, uh, and they named it in honor of Davy Crockett. Uh, but the reason being is that Davy Crockett was a very notable, uh, revered figure in Northwest Tennessee, where he lived in the 1820s um, while serving as uh, in the Tennessee Assembly, as well as during the time of, that he was a U.S. congressman. I think he was from the Gibson and Carroll County areas um, and was a very popular figure, uh, a very popular historical figure. Um, so anyway, the club was named in his honor. Um, and during the, uh, during that time, uh, the popularity of the commercial club was such that he upped his game a bit and he, uh, decided that he wanted to create a private club. So in 1954, he, uh, he recruited 50 members and they, put together a private club. And again, they called it Davy Crockett Hunting Club, but now it's Davy Crockett Hunting Club Incorporated. They had 50 initial members. That membership grew to 80 uh, in the early part of the years. But then in the latter part of the 50s, uh, a drought returned to the PPR area. And, uh, and duck populations, actually, they severely plummeted during that time frame, 
in the uh, around the turn of the decade in the early 1960s. Uh, and so with that drought, with the national duck population plummeting, waterfowling throughout the country suffered severely and re resulted in some of the most restrictive regulations in the history of waterfowl management. Um, and by that, I mean in 1961 alone, just the 1961 season in the Mississippi Flyway, hunters were limited to just a 23-day hunting season. Mm. Now, right now, we live in a time where it's a 60-day season. Uh, and back in 61, there was just a two-bird-per-day limit, only one of which could be a mallard. Wow. We're able to shoot six ducks a day, four of which can be mallards. Um, and duck hunters in the Mississippi Flyway that year shot on average just three birds for the entire season. Um, and in the end, in 1961, hunters throughout the country would shoot just 4 million ducks in the U.S. that year, which is the lowest number ever recorded before or since. So um, as the 10-year lease of the club came up for renewal, the, the club membership had scattered. And they could not renew the lease because they didn't have enough members. They tried to recruit members locally in the Union City and Northwest Tennessee area and the, some of the old hunters that had hunted with them, and they couldn't find any. So they came to the Nashville area, Franklin area, Dixon area, seeking 40 members to join a new club. And they found 40 members in that area as well as locally. They had enough. Um, and with those 40 members, one of whom was my father, um, back in 1963, they, uh, they created a new club. Um, but one of the things that they did is that they uh, decided not to renew the lease, but they instead purchased the land. Um, and in essence, the new club was formed. They kept the name Davy Crockett Hunting Club Incorporated. And some of the older members, I'm sure, joined yes. uh, with the new folks. And part of your research, you've pulled in a lot of artifacts. And one in particular was interesting to me. It was the letter uh, that they first sent out, uh, the uh, cost to buy a share of stock into the new club was $150 with annual dues of not more than $20. So yes. <laughs> I wish that was still the same. Yeah, bad. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was not very much. Uh, and you also, you know, talked about some of the challenges of people living elsewhere and coming here to hunt. That uh, poaching was a problem, and even the people that were hired to watch the poachers poached. You know, yes, <laughs> that's that's exactly right. And and that happened during the uh, the nineteen fifty four to sixty three time frame. And that was, and then another another um, challenge to both waterfowl hunting, but also a big challenge to conservation was channelization um, of of the waterways and the rivers here in in uh, West Tennessee. Uh, can you touch a little bit on that for folks who this is all new to? Yeah, yeah. They um, for years every winter um, there were rains. And the farmers were plagued by flooding. They lost millions and millions of dollars in, uh, in flood damage to not only their crops, um, their land, their homes. Um, and that continued during the growing season as well. And so in an effort to, the only, in an effort to reduce the, the continuous annual flooding, uh, they felt that the only thing that they could do was to straighten out the river because the Obine River, the Forkadir uh, River, both were very windy and were very susceptible to, to flooding the adjacent farmland. And the farmers uh, during that time, they were eager to grow uh, soybeans in particular. It was a, a, a very profitable crop, uh, but they lost so much in crop damage from the flooding that they had to do something. So really, in the early 1900s, they started straightening out. They started uh, building drainage ditches adjacent to or through the main 
uh, river waterways. And these were these straight channels that shot through. And for periodic times in, you know, in the early 1910s and 1920s, they were lengthening and deepening these channels in an effort to divert the waters away from their lands. Um, and so they thought channelization was the answer to their flooding. But what happened as the years went by is that the this channelization created a lot of silting and uh, where dirt and other products, including timber, were carried downstream, causing more blockage, making the, the flooding even worse. So it actually worsened the flooding. And in addition to that, cropland and timber were flooded sometimes year round and they lost timberland. They lost tens of thousands of acres of oak trees and other hardwood timber uh, during that time frame. Um, it ultimately resulted in a, we don't, we don't need to get into it and I can't get into the details of it, but it resulted in a, a very famous suit against the Corps of Engineers in the 1970s. To is that acres versus reser? Yes, it is. Exactly. And, uh, and that suit stopped the Corps of Engineers from further channelization. It went on back and forth through the courts for another decade, but ultimately the governor at the time signed into action that uh, all channelization would stop because of the recognition of the damage that had been done uh, through the efforts of the Corps. We actually have the uh, uh, the gentleman who led the charge on that was given an award, and we have his award here on display and tell Please. that story. Clark Akers. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, we have his award here, and we tell that story of his lawsuit that went on for 20, 15, 20 years, yeah, um, and actually changed, you know, it really was, it's considered uh, like the first major environmental victory against the government, uh, and so it's interesting that it was right here in our neighborhood, and so uh, uh -huh. we we have a little bit of a, of that on exhibit here, so I'm glad you mentioned That's that. Great. yeah. So what about now? What, what's, what is, the, there's a club obviously now, and how's the duck hunting this year? Well, the, uh, the, the, uh, we're kind of in a, uh, you know, in a time where there is a bit of a drought in the PPR. Um, there, uh, the rains over the last few years have not been plentiful. The, uh, duck populations have dropped a bit over the last few years. Uh, we've had a lot of warmer weather, which is, uh, I think, uh, it has prevented the full migration early in the season that we wish to have. Um, so things have been uh, not as good as they have been in the past. Um, but we're hopeful that this year, with uh, with rains in that area that the uh, the populations are will be emboldened again and we'll have a good uh, good season. Are you uh, a member of Ducks Unlimited and yes. our good friends and Delta over there? Absolutely. Yeah. Both both organizations are tremendous and and here in our state and uh, we're very proud of the work that they do. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, just. To, Every member of our club is uh, has memberships in both as well, and have been for many, many years, and support the the local enterprises um, throughout the state. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, I want to ask you a little bit more about uh, how you went about doing all this research and and what that was like. So we'll be right back. For many. The Hatchie River is a restorative sanctuary and a place to feel connected to something larger than ourselves. The Hatchie River Conservancy is working to conserve and sustain the river's natural integrity and scenic beauty for generations to come. For more information on how you can help, visit HatchieRiver.org. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is John Nesbitt. Um, should I call you Dr. Uh, Nesbitt, or have you retired that as well? No, I have not retired that, but don't call <laughs> me too formal. 
<laughs> so especially for this topic um so um you at some point you decided to retire i don't know if you worked on this any before you retired but uh talk to me about what made you decide to start gathering this information um that's a, a good question and i i say it's been i would i i would say that it has been a seed that was planted years ago I enjoy history, and I uh, have thought that the history of the club needed to be written at some point because uh, we just didn't know it. And we were losing some of that corporate history as the older members uh, retired or gave up their memberships um, or passed on. And we were losing that. And I, so uh, when I retired, I had a little more time on my hands. Um, over the past uh, couple of decades, a few other members have talked about putting together a history because, again, people didn't know the whole story of the club, and and it was important. And I was curious enough, and uh, I guess I just happened to be the first person out of the gates to start looking into it. <laughs> so it it fell to me, which was I think a privilege for me to do that. And I uh, there were old records that were in boxes, old minutes of the club. Uh, that were given to me. These were dusted off, given to me boxes that hadn't been opened in a long time. And I went through every box paper by paper uh, to look back uh, at all that had gone on since uh, the 1950s. And it was fascinating. And I would go th through a paper, come across something that was interesting, look it up, and I'd follow that rabbit down that rabbit hole. And which would lead me to another rabbit hole and would lead me to research this or that, or I come across a book or a, a, a national article or I had a reference to Delta Waterfowl or to Ducks Unlimited. And it was the more I read, the more interesting things got. It was just a it was a, a, a fabulous venture for me uh, to pursue this. Um, some of the information, I think, is rather mundane, but. I think some people might find find it interesting. Um, and uh, ultimately, I cobbled it together and put it in the text that you part of which you saw. Do you have someone who's uh, proofing it for you, like a friend who's reading it or your wife or no <laughs> some uh, I've given it to some of the members uh, to to look through and uh, I think like the other book that I wrote, it, uh, it puts them to sleep. Um, and, uh, I, it's relatively easy to read, but, uh, it has a lot of information. There are a few funny stories in it. Some of which I didn't provide to you. There's some anecdotes and I wanted it to serve as a, uh, as a template for others to contribute their thoughts their experiences, their ideas, their uh, any information that they have that uh, that others have told them about the club that others may not know about. So it, it really is a it's a living journal and a forum for others to participate. And that's what I wanted it to be, to ultimately to be uh, a, a journal provided to the members uh, that they can claim as their own. Now, this is all still new, and so uh, you and I talked about whether or not you were going to publish it or not, and that's still something to be determined. Um, you know, currently, you have to be in the club to be able to see all this and get the information, but as as I told you, I thought more and more people would be interested um, in, the, in, in what's in it, so at some point, you may look at publishing this, which is great. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of what you um, uh, have, the work you've done, and work together to to put a little blog post on our site with some of the information um, that people can read. Because I, again, you know, especially if you're from around here, it's so fascinating. People drive by that Davy Crockett hotel or what used to be the Davy Crockett hotel every day and don't have any idea of the history, you know, of what is behind that building. So I think that's why what you're doing is so important is to help people know and remember those who have come before. So I think that's, yeah. it's crucial. Well, uh, I think they people have a, a lot more to add than they think. 
And uh, and I wanted to make sure that we got this down, documented, uh, before people, uh, you know, passed on. If something is undocumented, it remains just that to the end. And if we have it in hand and we can put it in print, all the better for others. You never know what's important. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely right. Like here we have our military uh, history theater where people have, you know, years ago, I, uh, you know, 11, 12 years ago, they recorded their stories, put them in this uh, theater, and a lot of them are no longer with us. And so it's great that we have their story and their memories of serving in the military. Yeah, yeah. That's a an excellent display, by the way. Thank really you. Enjoyed, really enjoyed being there with my son last year. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, when you come this year to go to go hunting, you'll have to come by and we'll show you uh, some of the waterfowl uh, exhibits that have been added since you were here yeah. last. I look forward to it. Um, well, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing a little bit about the Davy Crockett Hunting Club. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And thanks to all you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>